So today's session, we're going to be speaking about Streptococcus pneumoniae. It's a very common organism, and it's one you'll come across very often when you are on the wards. So going through a bit of microanatomy, uh, the term strepto means chain, and coccus means round-shaped. And we did say in the previous session, talking about Staphylococcus aureus, that the coccus means round-shaped with Staphylococcus aureus as well. But here we have strepto, meaning, meaning chain, and the reason for this is they tend to, they tend to live in chains. Streptococci tend to live in chains, and pneumonia refers to the fact that it's mostly com it's the most common cause of pneumonia. Um, so it's round bacteria that tend to grow in chains, and they have a thick peptidoglycan cell wall, and they take in purple dye when gram stained, very very similar to Staphylococcus aureus. So talking about some of its qualities, it's a facultative anaerobe, so it can survive in both an aerobic and anaerobic environment. It's non-motile and non spore Again, these are similar characteristics of Staphylococcus aureus. It is catalase negative, and this is a test used in microbiology to differentiate between Staphylococcus, Staphylococci and Streptococci. And what I said from the previous session is that Staphylococci and Staphylococcus aureus in particular is catalase positive, and so now, if we know it's catalase negative, we know it's not Staphylococcus, uh, it's not Staphylococci. It also um, pro produces alpha hemolysis. And what this means is when it's grown on blood agar, it produces hydrogen peroxide. And this partially oxidizes the red hemoglobin to give you this partial, hy partial hydrolysis to form green methemoglobin. And that's what you can see in this picture on the right. Now the difficulty is then you know that it's streptococci, but you want to differentiate between different streptococci. And the way that they do this in a lab is you use an optical test. And because streptococcus pneumonia in particular is optical sensitive, there'll be no growth around the, around the disc. And it's also biosolu biosoluble. So again, this is a biosolubility test and streptococcus pneumonia compared to other streptococci is biosoluble, whereas uh, other streptococci will be bio-insoluble. So I just thought, just to give you the bigger picture, just to go through uh, the tests that they'll conduct in microbiology. But let's talk about its virulence factors and what makes it um, so infectious and what, what leads to it, it having it, these characteristics to cause infection. So first of all, it's an encapsulated uh, bacteria and this protects it gives it a good protective mechanism against the body's immune response it also has pili and fimbri these are these hair-like structures that you can see on the picture on the right that allow it to attach and once it attaches it can it can colonize that area and if it begins to grow and multiply it can start to cause uh, an infection it also has a surface protein a pneumococcal surface protein a which we'll talk about in more detail in the next few slides. And like Staphylococcus, um, it has the ability to produce toxins. Three toxins that we need to know about is IgA protease, autolysin, and pneumolysin. So as well as this, it has the ability to form a biofilm. We spoke about biofilms when we were spoke, speaking about Staphylococci. And a biofilm is a layer of slime and essentially it starts to produce this extracellular matrix um, of exopolysaccharides, EPS, and over time it completely surrounds the bacteria. You can see in this image, uh, you can see the bacteria and you can see this, this blue colored layer of slime. And what bacteria can essentially do in this layer of, of slime is they can thrive, they don't divide rapidly, but they're very difficult to penetrate in a biofilm. And this makes it very difficult to treat with the antibiotic. So if they are infecting, for example, an indwelling catheter, a prosthetic heart valve, the, the main thing that microbiology would advise is removing that surface or replacing that surface just because of that difficulty of getting rid of that biofilm. Another thing that bacteria can do within a biofilm is they can communicate with each other by using chemical signals. And these, this communication can involve the exchange of bacterial resistance. So I spoke to you about three toxins, 
and I'll speak to you about why these toxins are important. So you've got IgA protease. This is an enzyme that destroys immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin A, so IgA. IgA normally binds IgA normally binds to invading bacteria and allows neutrophils to destroy them. So destroying IgA would compromise the immune response. They also have this surface protein, uh, pneumococcal surface protein A, PSPA. And what this does, it, it inhibits uh, the complement activation. So this complex immune surveillance system that we have within our bodies. And this avo essentially avoids opsonization and avoids destruction. Um, again, it's one of its ways in which it, it avoids the immune response. Now, they also produce an enzyme called autolysin, which is very important. And what autolysin does, it, it essentially activates the breakdown of the bacteria. And this will release all of its internal components um, into, the surrounding, uh, into the surrounding area and activate the immune response. It enhances the local inflammation, and this can lead to destruction of host tissues, so tissues around it, such as the pneumocytes or alveolar capillaries. Um, so it has this kind of destructive mechanism. And within this, it also releases the next toxin that I'm talking about, pneumolysin. The reason why autolysin is so important, um, especially from a microbiologist's point of view, is when they say that you're taking a sample and you're treating... Uh, let's say you're treating community acquired pneumonia, so it's the, it's a possibility of it being caused by streptococci. When you take this sample, um, the difficulty is once it gets to the lab, if the streptococcus pneumonia has autolyzed and essentially destroyed its surrounding wall, it's very difficult. It makes it very difficult to identify. Sometimes they they're either using the anti the pneumococcal antigen to identify it, or they're using what looks like, they'll identify what looks like a diplococci. So um, this is essentially how streptococci live. And then once they test it with, by growing it on blood, blood agar, they won't find anything because it's autolyzed. So the ma main thing to do, the main thing to tell a clinician is to get that sample taken and tested as soon as possible. So then we've got pneumolysin, which is released. This activates the host complement system, which is a set of these plasma proteins involved in immunity and results in local inflammation and destroys surrounding, uh, it, destroys, uh, it destroys the bacteria and it also destroys the host tissue around it. So let's talk about uh, where it normally lives. Uh, streptococcus pneumoniae normally colonizes the nasal cavity and the sinuses and it normally causes no problems, but it can cause problems with people with a weakened immune response. This will in involve infants, elderly, those with HIV infections, diabetes, malignancy, or, or alcohol abuse. Now, some toxin compounds in cigarette smoke can also weaken the local respiratory defense mechanisms, and this makes these patients more susceptible to streptococcus pneumoniae infections. So what kind, of, what kind of infections can it cause? We said that it normally colonizes the nasal cavity and sinuses. So if it colonizes this area and it begins to multiply, um, the mucous membrane lining the nose and the par uh, paranasal sinuses can get inflamed. And this leads to symptoms of fever, facial pain, and headaches. And this leads to the complication of rhinosinusitis. And if the walls of the parasinuses are, because the walls of the parasinuses are very thin, strep pneumonia can essentially get across this, uh, this thin uh, lining and can get into the cranial cavity. And this is one of the ways in which it can cause meningitis. So meningitis is an infection of the protective membranes that surround the brain in the spinal cord, the meninges. And symptoms include fever, neck stiffness, and headaches. Now, there's quite, there's a few ways in which you can essentially develop uh, meningitis from strep pneumonia, and we'll go through all of them. So we've gone through the fact that rhinosinus, rhinosinusitis can lead uh, to meningitis, uh, secondary to secondary to rhinosinus, rhinosinusitis, but you you can also get otitis media. This is when strep pneumonia invades the eustachian tube 
that connects to the middle ear. And otitis media is essentially an infection of the middle ear. Symptoms will include pain and earache. And if a patient has chronic, if a patient has chronic otitis media, it can spread to the mastoid antrum. And this is behind the ear and it can cause uh, mastoiditis. If it then spreads from the mastoid antrum uh, to the cranial cavity, this again can lead to meningitis. So now we know it, from both the nasal ca cavity as well as the ear, um, strep pneumonia can cause meningitis. But the most common, the most common infection it causes is community acquired pneumonia. The way it does this is it sticks to alveolar cells and it releases pneumolysin, which leads to the destruction of the pneumocytes and alveolar capillaries surrounding it. The symptoms of pneumonia will include fever, chills, chest pain, and a cough. Now, in severe cases, strep pneumonia can cross the alve alveoli capillary wall and can then enter the bloodstream. And we spoke about this before. Once bacteria is in the bloodstream, we call this bacteremia. Now, bacteremia can, of course, lead to sepsis. So it can lead to hypoperfusion um, of the vital organs. And if the vital organs are not receiving a suffic a sufficient, uh, sufficient blood, uh, then this is the body's immune response um, to the bacteremia, which is sepsis. And of course, this is life-threatening. One thing that's particularly important is speaking about the spleen. The spleen is a fist-sized organ um, to the upper left side of your abdomen. And it's important, it's a very important part of your immune, immune system. You can survive without it, and there are people that survive without it. The reason you can survive without it is because the liver can take over many of the spleen's functions. But those without a spleen, or a spleen that is not functioning properly, are more prone uh, to, get, to getting streptococcus pneumonia infections. So it's worse with individuals that have undergone a splenectomy, or if they have sickle cell disease, because those with sickle cell disease have functional, functional asplenia, meaning they have the spleen tissue, but it does not function uh, to its proper ability. It can also lead to pneumococcal endocarditis. So we spoke about endocarditis before, and we said that this is where um, bacteria can, can grow on heart valves in clumps called vegetations, and parts of these vegetations can break off and embolize further around the body. But pneumococcal endocarditis, so endocarditis caused by strep pneumonia is a very rare condition. So it's something you probably won't come across. Uh, it can also lead to, per lead to pericarditis, and this is where it infects the pericard pericardium that infect the protective lining surrounding the heart, and pus can collect in the pericardial sac. Again, this is life-threatening, but it's, it can be life-threatening, but it's rare. It can also invade the joint space, just like Staphylococcus aureus, and lead to the formation of septic arthritis. And here we're going to speak about bacteremia again. So it can enter the bloodstream, but then it can also cross, cross the blood-brain barrier and can cause meningitis this way. So we, na we now know there's several ways in which it can cause uh, meningitis. It can also cause intracranial or spinal epidural abscess, just like Staphylococcus aureus. Once in the blood bloodstream, if it goes to the perineum, it can cause spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And this is something that's more commonly seen in individuals with cirrhosis uh, who develop ascites or patients with too much fluid in that peritoneal cavity. In order to diagnose, in a general term, in order to diagnose someone uh, with a streptococcus pneumonia infection, we can take culture and sensitivity tests. We can either do this by taking a, a sample of, of pus, sputum, if they've got symptoms of community-acquired pneumonia, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, if they've got symptoms of, symptoms of meningitis, if it, they've got symptoms of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, we can take peritoneal fluid and grow that on culture, uh, use that for culture and sensitivity testing. We can also use PCR to detect strep pneumonia DNA. So how do, in from a general sense, let's talk about prevention and treatment. So high-risk individuals should be vaccinated, and we'll go through this in more detail in the next slide. 
and we of course treat it with antibiotics. We do treat it with beta-lactam antibiotics, but the problem with using uh, beta-lactam antibiotics is the fact, the problem we use in beta-lactam antibiotics is their ability. Um, a lot of beta-lactam an antibiotics have now developed resistance um, to streptococcus, streptococcus pneumoniae, and this increased the use of fluoroquinolones such as ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin. Also, the combination of beta-lactam antibiotics with beta-lactamase inhibitors um, has increased, and this is this is why, uh, especially with severe cases of community-acquired pneumonia, we use comoxiclav. That combination of amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. Uh, the clavulanic acid, of course, inhibits the beta-lactamase from essentially destroying uh, the amoxicillin. And third generation cephalosporins. The reason why we use third generation cephalosporins is they're very stable against beta lactamases and therefore they, they are not destroyed by these beta lactamases. And in these cases where you've got people with severely resistant strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, you, have, you have the availability of vancomycin and linazidib. So, of course, within these sessions, we'll go through it in a very broad sense. Once we start talking about different infectious diseases, we can start talking about guidelines and bringing that into play. So we spoke about vaccines. You've got two vaccines. You've got the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, PCV13. Now, this contains caps capsular polysaccharides specific to 13 streptococcus pneumoniae serotypes, and it's bound to a non-toxic recombinant variant of the diphtheria toxin. And this is called CRM197. Now, this serves, the, the reason why it's combined with this diphtheria toxin is it, the diphtheria toxin serves as a carrier protein. And this PCV13 is recommended for young children. We also have the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, PPSV23. And this contains 23 purified capsular antigens. Uh, PPSV23 is given to people that are aged over 65 and over and people who are at risk because they have long-term health conditions. So we spoke about HIV as well as uh, those such as those in the sickle cell uh, disease groups. So we've spoken about those are the two vaccines that are available. Um, in order to summarize, so streptococcus pneumonia is a gram-positive bacteria uh, that lives in chains, not change. <laughs> And it colonizes the nasal cavity and the sinuses. Um, and it, can it normally doesn't cause a problem, but it can take advantage of those with a weakened immune system. It can cause rhinosinusitis, uh, otitis media, pneumonia, uh, as well as meningitis. And the treatment would involve the use of penicillins, but resistant strains, you would use fluoroquinolones, third generation cephalosporins, um, as well as beta a combination of beta lactamate beta-lactam and beta-lactamase inhibitor antibiotics and very resistant strains you can consider the possibility of vancomycin and linazolid. So I hope you found that useful. I, I think um, because we've gone through two of the common bacteria, we'll start to go through an infection in the next session. Um, so I'll set that up for the next two weeks and then we can start talking about specific antibiotic uh, options that we treat, that we use for specific infectious diseases. I hope you found this useful.